Praise the Lord. Just say the name. Hallelujah. I'm coming to you today, and I want to share something with you that we've read over and over. It's not going to be anything new, but what it does is help us to look at the Word of God and maybe for what you're going through right now. I don't know about you, but all the stuff that's on the news is discouraging. Every time you turn around, there's something terrible happening. And me in the position that I'm in down at the jail, many times when I hear the stuff, I said, oh, God, they're coming down here. That means that I have to see them, deal with them, minister to them. And many times, you know, my flesh wants to say, mm-mm, they don't need to have God. But yes, they do. And so I, a lot of times I'm sorry that I have to see it on the news because I already know what it is that they've done. I'd rather not know, go and minister, and then afterwards. But God is good, and he allows me to do what he's called me to do. And so in listening to the news, you know, I just heard that um, they just had another bombing in a, another synagogue, the Sri Lanka just this weekend, the baby that was thrown over the balcony, and all the things that are going on, terrible, horrible things that are going on that we need prayer. Yes. Yes. Now, I know that we walk around and different ones and say, pray for me, pray for me. And the importance of that is that we do it and do and say exactly what is needed. Not go away, okay, I'll pray for you. No, stop right then and pray. And so this today, I want to give it to you so we be encouraged to know there's somebody special praying for you. And his name is Jesus. And so the scriptures speak of Jesus triumphant entry into Jerusalem as the people cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. But just in a few minutes, they were going to be coming saying, crucify him. And so sometimes we are concerned about people that um, say they're so willing to pray for you because one minute they're praying for you, the next the minute they're condemning you. And so we have to be careful who we receive prayer for, you know. And so here's Jesus. He, if he was all wrapped up in the fact that they say in Hosanna, he wouldn't have been prepared for when they say crucify him. And so using the words in St. John, six days before Passover, Jesus starts preparing his disciples for his capture his persecution and his uh, persecution and crucifixion the devil is a liar why because the disciples must continue to be a witness they must continue to lift up the kingdom of God and so without having their head there so they could physically see them they needed to know to go on anyhow and so again that comes to us because one minute God is blessing us and we're receiving it and we're happy and another minute you have to go through a trial and you're like, okay, God, where are you? He's there as never before. But we need to learn to move by faith and not just by sight. Jesus informs them of who he is because their belief is of ruling and reigning on earthly kingdom. Again, in the Sunday school lesson today, he's telling them, you know, he's died and he's risen again and they're seeing him. And it says he saw him for 40 days. And yet and still, when he gets finished, they say, Lord, when, when are you going to come and, and reign? Because they're talking about here on earth. But he's talking about his reign in heaven. And so even though God has done great things for us, Sometimes we get it twisted about what it is that he's trying to bring us to. And what it really is that he's trying to bring us to the place that we are witnesses for him right now, right here, in the midst of the situation that you're in. And he's not going to deliver you from it because he wants to use you in it. And so this is what he's teaching his disciples. As they share what we call the Last Supper, Jesus begins to explain forthcoming events. 
Jesus is the ever caring God and Savior. And while knowing of his pending torture and death, he's concerned about his disciples. He's concerned about them. Now, stop and wait a minute, you know, because I had to think about myself. If I'm about to die, I don't know if I'm thinking about anybody else. Okay, especially when you know how it's going to happen. I got to get myself prepared. Don't come to me asking for prayer now. <laughs> you know, I, I, I got to get me. You should be praying for me. But it says that he wanted to get his disciples ready for what was going to happen to him. So how do we know that? First thing it says that at this supper, he washes their feet. Now, wait a minute. He's the head. But you mean that he forgot about, didn't forget about, but stopped worrying about being crucified and said, come on, let me wash his feet. And yet, Peter had the nerve to say, uh-uh, you ain't washing my feet. Wow. Uh-uh. See, because he didn't have a clue of what our Lord was getting ready to go through. But then when the Lord said, you don't have a part with me, he said, oh, wash my whole body. Uh. See, then we get greedy. <laughs> Okay, Lord said, there's no need for me to do all that. Just let me wash your feet. And so he's teaching him that. He explains his leaving that they cannot follow at this time, but later. And here we go with Peter again. Lord, where are you going that I can't go? (laughs) And the Lord said, Peter, if you just knew, you're going to deny me. Remember, Peter said, no, I'll die for you. But yet we know the story. Peter denied him. Not only that, but after he denied him and then saw that they came and got him in the garden, he ran. And he denied him. And he went back to fishing. (laughs) And not by himself. The other disciples went too. (laughs) Just want you to know what Jesus had to deal with. But yet still concerned about them, he said, I'm going to send you a comforter. He wanted them to know that I'm leaving as far as this body's concerned and you won't see me, but I'm not leaving you with nothing. And so when I read that, I say, God, he had us in mind at the same time. And we weren't even there. Woo! Jesus informs them of who he is. Why did he have to tell them that? They had been with him for three years. You would think they would know him. Well, I'm not even going to ask you how long you've been with him and still don't know things. <laughs> uh-huh. Come on. Hallelujah. I, and I'm in that group because there's things that I don't know. But as I keep living for the Lord, I get to learn a little bit more and a little bit more. Thank God he's so merciful. He doesn't let us see it all at one time. We couldn't deal with it. So here's these disciples that have been living with him, seeing him do these miracles and all that. But it says that the moment that he was taken captive, they scattered. They ran. Why? Because they did not know who he was. They just knew what he did. And that was the miracles and the feeding of them and touching the bodies. But that was it. So Jesus tells them who he is. I want to tell you who he is. Scripture tells us. He's the true vine. I am the true vine, and my father is the husband man. Now, maybe you don't know what a husband man is, but a husband man is one whose business it is to cultivate the ground. He makes sure that you're ready to produce, that when the seed of the word is planted in you, it will grow and multiply. He's our husband man. All right? He didn't leave us to the weeds. (laughs) <laughs> he didn't leave us to whatever would grow in there. <laughs> but he stays on his job to take out anything that is not of him if we allow him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The next thing he tells them, and that's this one really blessed me, that he's the son of God. He's Jesus. But here's the plus to that. So are we. Oh, yeah. It tells us in 1 John 3, 2, it says, upon accepting salvation, we become sons of God. And here's what it says. Beloved, now we are the sons of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be. But woo, when we see him, we shall be. Ain't that something? Thinking about us, thinking about us, thinking about us. That we are 
sons of God, because we accept salvation. Then he says to them that the world, those non-believers, will hate him. And guess what? They're going to hate you. Because you believe in him. But that's okay. Some of us have gotten in groups that other people have hated. We didn't care. That, those were our buds. You know, they come up and they pound you now, you know, and all that. I watch them in jail, and I'm like, are, are you? For real? Yeah. That's what I say, for real? In jail? Please. I have people that uh, connect themselves with those who are incarcerated, and here I come trying to tell them something else. You know, I'll give you an example. I do work with the juveniles because I see that we do have juveniles. Do you know we have like 20 juveniles that are in jail because they have committed an adult crime? The bad thing about that is they're juveniles from 15 to 17 years old. So they can, can't really participate in different programs because they can't be with adults, even though they are convicted as the adults. And so that means that they sit around all day, as I tell them, you sit around, you play cards, you watch TV, and you lie. Yeah. This is what you do. And so I went to one young man, because the blessing in them being incarcerated is if they haven't finished school, they have to go to school. Okay, AIU is down there, and they have to go to school. And so they have lessons they have to do. And this one young man, he wasn't doing his lesson. So I went to see him. To see, you know, because the teachers say, okay, you like bothering with them, go see. So I went to see him. I'm like, um, he came down the steps to see me. I didn't see no papers in his hand or nothing. I'm like, okay. I said, where's, where's your homework? He said, oh, I didn't do it. I said, oh, wait, wait, wait. You must have been up all night watching TV. Well, they ain't got no TV. <laughs> I said, I know, you, you, was, you got a roommate, and you hanging out with the roommate talking. He don't have a roommate. I said, so why didn't you do your homework? Well, see, the thing is, he didn't get in the group with the people. And the first thing he said, I don't want to get my degree. I want a GED. I said, I said let me tell you something. You're never going to get a GED. I said, first of all, because they're going to test you to see where you uh, place at, and you're not going to place anywhere. <laughs> and so you're not going to get the GED. And you were supposed to be graduating in June, which is almost here, but the GED is going to take you longer than that, and you're going to quit, and you can't go back to school once you yeah. drop out. Right. to go. To right. But he wants to be in the group. Wow. God is great. God is great. <laughs> And so he's telling them, don't allow yourself to be swayed because of those who are not going to like you just because of who you associate with. And so here we go. And it says that Jesus goes aside and he prays to God, his father. He prays for himself. He prays for his disciples, his followers, and he prays for us. And so let me read the scripture. My scripture is in John, the 17th chapter, verse 8 to 10. And then we'll go to verses 13 to 19 and 22. And it reads thus. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. 13. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word. And thy world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. 
And the last verse, and the glory, 22, which thou gavest me, I have given them that they may be one, even as we are one. That's his prayer for us. Now, usually when we say the Lord's Prayer, and that's why I didn't even name this the Lord's Prayer. I put a prayer for us, or you can call it the Lord's Prayer, because this would really be the Lord's Prayer. And not what is in Matthew 6, 9, or St. Luke 11, 1. Because they're identified, not in the Bible it doesn't say that, but that's what we say all the time. The Lord's Prayer, and they'll say, hallowed be thy name. No. Really, what they asked, the Lord gave the disciples what they asked for. They asked, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. And Jesus uses Matthew as an example of what the prayer should have in it. Because they asked to be taught, and he taught. And so let's look at this prayer real quick. And again, my title is A Prayer for Us, or The True Lord's Prayer. First of all, he says, our Father, which art in heaven. He says, when you pray, you have to bring up the relationship. Who are you praying to? Now, don't pray to get down there and pray to Buddha. Okay. Muhammad. Mm -mm. Hare Krishna. You better pray to God. So he says, hallowed be thy name. What is the name? Come on, we just sang it. What's the name? Yes, Jesus. Okay, yes, we call him God. It's interchangeable because all three in one, but you better know who you're talking to. And he says, hallowed be thy name. Holy is your name, Lord. There's something in that name. You know, we're name droppers. You, you know, we like to know somebody. When you come in, you like to drop the name, you know, because you think that'll get the door. Well, this is the door opener. (laughs) This is the window opener. This is the blessing dropper. His name is Jesus. Ha! Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallowed be thy name. All right. The next thing he says to them, now this is how you get your petitions. And so, first of all, we petition God for who he is. And so we're saying we submit to you, and it says thy kingdom come. come. Not mine. Your kingdom, God. I pray, I petition you that your kingdom come. We done had enough of our own. Aren't you tired of what you were trying to do? It didn't work. You know what? I say to some of the inmates down there, they done got in there and they thought they were cool. I said, "Um, is that working for you? (laughs) I, I, you know, it's not working for me. It's not working. You get down there and then, you know, you don't have the freedom that you thought. You ain't the boss like you thought. Somebody can tell you when to take it in, when to shut up, when to eat, what you're going to wear, and, and all that other stuff. Is that working for you? Then you need to call thy kingdom, not mine. Then he says, thy will be done. See, we, when are we going to learn? That you can't do what you want to do in God's kingdom. But, <laughs> you know, I don't care what title you put before your name. It will not go above the name of God. All right. So we need to realize that and say, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. Lord, I don't understand it, but thy will be done. Lord, it's hurting, but thy will be done. Okay, and so this is what's in that prayer. Now, the next part talks about man, what man has to do. And he says, give us this day. And we say that because our dependency is on him. Not just at salvation, but every day. Every day. You know what, God, God is so mighty. He wakes me up every morning. I'm usually at work at 630. And God wakes me up at 4 without an alarm. I set my alarm, and I get up before the alarm goes off. And sometimes I say, Lord, why don't you just let me sleep until the alarm goes off? 
because he wants me to prepare myself to say, Lord, what you want me to do today? Lord God, what's your will for me today? You're providing for me today. You know, I'm getting ready to go into the jail. Now I'm only 4'11", and some of them people are waiting. You know, my feet couldn't even hit the floor right there. <laughs> so you can imagine when I go into jail and I'm looking up at these people, and I don't know what their crimes are, but I'm going in one-on-one. -on -one. Wow. By the time an officer got to me, they could pulverize me down into the floor. But the fact is that I, God goes with me. Not too long ago, I was at um, a prayer meeting, and Sister Denise gave me a word. And I had her type it up. I said, because I need to have this. And the word said that when I go into the jail, I don't have to worry about the garden and being around me because God is around me. He got my back. When she said that, I said, oh, girl, y'all ain't said nothing now. <laughs> I, I, I'm really bold now. I'm going to go in there and tell them, uh, Jesus said. Amen. All right? Amen. And so God is saying to us, give us this day. You're our provider. You're my daily dependence. Without you, I can't do anything. I tell you now, when you wake up in the morning, before your feet hit the floor, as soon as your eyes open, God, thank you. This is another day. You know what, God? I'm alive. God, you know what? I know my name. God, you know what? Now my feet is moving over the side of the bed. Thank you, Jesus. You are my provider. He goes on and he says, forgive us. We forget that we needed forgiveness. And yet still we're holding somebody else captive. God said that we are to forgive them because we have been forgiven. And we need to realize that, that we have been forgiven. And not a little bit, but a lot. There's some stuff we did, you don't want nobody to know it. Oh, if I told you stuff about Sister Bird, you would say, please get out my pulpit. <laughs> because God has forgiven me of a lot. And here's the other secret, and still does. Hey. Woo! <laughs> we haven't arrived yet. The word says we're being perfected. We're not perfect yet, but we're being perfected. Woo! And he looks at us through the blood of Jesus. And he says, you know what? That's my child. I don't care what she did. She's my child. I have parents that come down to see their kids down there. And I look at them and I'm like, mm, mm, mm. And the parent says, but that's my child. That's my child. I don't care what they do. I watched on the news and saw that one who takes and harms a baby. And the mother says, I know that they did something wrong, but that's my child. That's my child. And I can't give up on them. Because guess what? You can get saved in jail. Amen. You can live a holy life in jail. Let me tell you again, at Christmas time, I received a card from a young lady who I had forgotten. But she sent me a card. And she says, I don't even know how she found me. Because guess what? It was 23 years ago that I ministered to her. She's a lifer. She sent me a card saying thank you for being for me and with me back then. God, in jail. And she told me, she said, I'm living more for God now than ever before. She said, don't worry about me. That's God. That was somebody's child. That God saved her and she had a life sentence. She's not out of jail. She's still in there, but she's not in jail. Woo! God said, forgive. We need to pray, forgive us. Then it goes on and says, lead us not into temptation. God doesn't tempt us with evil. What tempts us? Flesh. 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 <laughs> we are asking God to guide us from temptation. And let me warn you now, there is none of us in here that has not been tempted. And if you haven't so far, wake up tomorrow. The temptation will be there. Now, let me give you a warning. Temptation isn't something that you wouldn't do anyhow. Temptation is something that you like to do. And you may have not done it in a while. But it'll come back. <laughs> and you remember how it was. And it wasn't all that bad. The temptation. You enjoyed it. 
The temptation is there. That temptation is that it's possible for you to, to do it. But when you call on God, he keeps you from doing it. <laughs> so you're asking God, <laughs> you want to do it. I can remember how it was and how it felt and what I did and how I looked and all that stuff. The temptation, when you get to thinking back there, pretty soon you'll go back there. That's when we say, Lord, lead me not into temptation. Keep me from being guided by my flesh. Remember, James 1.14 says, every man is tempted when he's drawn away by his own lust and enticed. You're enticed by your own self. And then the last thing for man, it says, deliver us from evil. Evil is around us. And one of the things you all are blessed because you have a beautiful atmosphere in here. But there are some places that we go that the atmosphere is terrible. The atmosphere is terrible at the jail. <laughs> I'm telling you, you put all that crime and stuff in one place. If you are innocent, you start picking up the habits of what other people do. You see, when I go into jail, the women cuss more than the men. And the words are worse. I had to tell two uh, officers the other day, they were on the elevator for me, and they were all them words. And I'm standing there. And after a while, I had to say, excuse me. I'm talking about two women. I'm not talking about men. I'm talking about two women talking. And they were officers. The atmosphere. I heard an officer say, if you come in here and you're not a cusser, you will be. Because of the atmosphere that is there. We have to be delivered us from evil. Then the last part of that is a doxology, and it's called, Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. We need to remind ourselves what God is to all of us. He's the kingdom, the power, and the glory. And then he tops it off with one word. Amen. Amen. Which means, so be it. <laughs> That's the way it is. You know how it is. I'm looking around. Some of y'all is the same age as me, had parents that said, it's what I say. Right. Okay, when you get ready to say, but, uh, she, no, no, no. You live in this house? So be it. That's the way it is. God said, you're going to be in his kingdom? So be it. This is the way it is. Don't like it, got to move, live on your own. And so, as stated earlier, Jesus is preparing for death, and yet he is concerned for his disciples and their continual service for the kingdom. And as our loving Savior, Jesus desires for us to be victorious in our walk and service to him. So Jesus prays for his disciples, his followers, for us. So we come to my scriptures, and I'll be done. John 17, 1, he starts out, he looks toward heaven. This is Jesus, and he acknowledges that the hour is come. Listen to his words. He says, glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. Jesus is praying for himself because, remember, he just came out of the Garden of Gethsemane not too long ago saying, Lord, if you can, let this cup pass from me. But if not, Lord, not my will, your will. Somebody said to uh, us in our little prayer group, they said, guess what? You were the cup. Think about that. The cup that he didn't want to drink had us in it. Because, remember, he was sinless. What he drank was all of our sins. So he said, Lord, if I cannot, because he knew in drinking that sin, he was now going to be separated from his father for that moment till the blood. So he didn't want to be separated from his father. So he said, Lord, can I do this another way and not take this cup? But if he had not taken the cup, it wouldn't have been us because we were in the cup. Woo, Jesus, think about that. He drank everything that you have done so far or could have done. He said, I'll drink it. So your will be done, not my will. And so now he's praying. He said, glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify thee. God, this that I do brings glory to you. It's shame to me because they looked on him and even God had to turn his back on him. But it glorified the father. 
And he says what he wants us to do is to glorify the Father. But remember, Jesus has to be the first example. And so I believe these words were spoken after his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he said, if possible, but not my will, thy will be done. Please understand, I don't believe there was ever any hesitation to Jesus' divine part to die for us. I don't think it was a hesitation about that. In the garden, he was in his humanity. And the flesh said, I don't want to do this. But the spirit said, I will do this. (laughs) Woo, Jesus. See, he had to fight against that flesh just like us because the scripture says we have not a high priest that hasn't been touched with the feeling of your infirmity. So the things that you go through, he's already gone through that. He knows what it is for the flesh to hurt and yet and still go on anyhow. So he's saying I have to do it because the people coming after me need to know that when they pray to me, I know what it is that they need. Woo, God, I know what you need. When you come on and say, God, help me. He says, I know just what kind of help you need. See, it's different than the doctors we have today. I always tell people when you go, you're going to a practitioner. He doesn't really know. He's hoping that he's able to see something in the blood on the x-ray or something. But Jesus knows. Jesus knows because he was there. He felt it. Woo, Jesus. He knows the battle that you're going through. He knows how we have to have spirit over the flesh. He understands that. And so after all this, we have to remember that we can go to him with anything because he knows. He knows. He's not like that person that comes visit you in the hospital ain't never been sick time. I know how you feel. No, you don't. He, he's not like that person that comes to you. You didn't just had the death of somebody in your family. Now, I know how you No, you don't. Until you get there and have to go through it, you do not know. All you can say is, I'm here for you because I don't know. But whatever you need, I'm here for you. But Jesus can say, I know. I know. Hallelujah. Next, Jesus prays for them. He intercedes on their behalf. And one of the things we have to realize, you can't pray for anybody if you don't pray for yourself first. Pray for yourself first. That's not being selfish. That's being wise. I always ask people, you ever been on an airplane? And when the stewardess comes out and tells you all the things and the exits and all that, the last thing they say is, oh, there's an airbag. It's going to drop down. When it drops down, you're to put it where? You first, honey. I don't care if you got a brand new baby. Do not put it on that brand new baby. Because that baby will be inhaling and you'll be passing out. Then who's going to hold it for the baby? You better put it on you first. Get all that you need. Then you can minister. God is saying you pray for yourself first. Then you can pray for somebody else. I don't want nobody to pray. If it don't work for you, it ain't going to work for me. So, you know, you've been praying for yourself. Is it working? If it's working, okay. It ain't working. Uh, Don't pray for me. You know what? I'll I'll pass. I'll pray for me. All right? So now Jesus is coming. Oh, Jesus. It's just common sense. Just common sense. You know, you don't even have to be deep on that. Just common sense. All right? So he says, now this is my focus for the rest of the message. It's about you. A prayer for us. And so in verse 9 and 10, it says, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. I usually take and read it in another version, and so I read the Message Bible. And here's what it says. I pray for those you gave me, for they are yours by right. Everything mine is yours and yours mine, and my life is on display in them. We are the witness for the Lord. People are looking at us to see, is God all that you say? And so he is praying for us. He says, I'm praying for you that belong to my father because my father and I are one. And I'm praying even that God is able to take you through because you're on display for everybody else that comes around you. We don't just get to witness with our mouth. 
Some people you may never get to say a word to, but your life, if they see you over in the corner puffing, if they see you coming out of gnats or whatever bar is out there now, <laughs> if they see you on the corner and you got them many, <laughs> and the women too, then they say, he ain't no different than us. So God says, I pray for them. Remember in the scripture where uh, the Lord, before he was getting ready to go, he says, I pray for you that the devil doesn't sift you like wheat. Because us against the devil, we can't win. But it's the power of God that allows us to win. So Jesus prays. So here's, I have seven points that he prayed for us for, and then I'll be done. The first one says, keep them from evil. Sounds like the same thing they said in Matthew, but now he's telling, he's praying for us. He's not telling us how to pray. He says, I'm praying this. All right. He says, keep them. Don't take them out of the world. Leave them in the world, but not of the world. We have to show the world how to live. Not them show us. We, we've been trying to follow them, and, and it don't work. It doesn't fit. If you're in Jesus, it's not going to fit anymore. You know what? I used to smoke cigarettes. I know y'all doesn't believe that, but, you know, when I wasn't saved, I wasn't always saved, as you heard in my bio. It didn't happen until I was 20. Well, I had high school years and all that other stuff, and I smoked, you know, because it was cool to smoke. And I smoked cools. You know, <laughs> hey, you know, and then I went to college. And when I went to college, you know, you have that break time. And then you, and what do you do? You smoke. Well, in the meantime, I got saved. All right. And so when I would go on break, I told God, I said, I'm not going to buy no more cigarettes. I didn't buy no more. But I sure could bum. <laughs> so come break time. And I said, can I have a cigarette, please? They give me a cigarette. Well, the first inhale, because remember, I said I wasn't going to smoke no more. Took a hell, and I went, <coughs> almost choked to death. I said, okay, put that down. That didn't solve it. I come out the next break. I said, um, you have anything besides a cool? <laughs> so somebody gave me a Virginia Slim with it, nothing. <laughs> What'd you say, in your house? <laughs> Virginia Slim, no comparison to cools. <laughs> Not nothing. Okay? But guess what? I took that puff and almost choked off the Virginia Slim. I said, okay, that's enough. Still wasn't enough. You know, I go home, and I had told my family, you know, I'm not smoking no more. And they go outside. My daughter went outside playing. I said, oh, ain't nobody here. I can smoke a cigarette. I pulled out the cigarette, and I heard God's voice say, I see you. I said, woo! I ain't smoked a cigarette since then. God says, keep them from evil. And I know I'm not the only one having that experience. You know you went to pick up that glass and you looked at it and saw Jesus' face in there and said, whoa. Huh? You know you took and drank it and it tastes like water. And you said, oh, this is a waste of my money. You know you went to talk to that girl and your tongue got all twisted. You couldn't say nothing. <laughs> huh? You, you got the babbling. You said, what is wrong with me? God keeping you from evil. God keeping you from evil. He said, you're in the world, but you're not of the world. You're different. He said, don't use God's word, grace, and mercy to wound and kill other people. You're not in the world. You don't act like the other ones do. Now, I know it's hard to turn the other cheek because it's hard for me, you know. But God said, there's a way. You don't do word for word. You don't do tit for tat. You don't kill their dog because they killed your cat. You are God. And he's praying for you. The second thing he's praying for you is sanctify them through thy truth. Sanctify means to set you aside for God's use. We were so used to getting our own thing because we had to make sure we were the success at the top of the ladder. God said, I'm sanctifying you. He says, in other words, and this is a, a verse that stays with me all the time. It says, be holy for I am holy. Now, here's the thing. I don't know if you ever tried it. Read it backwards. Reading it backwards, it says the same thing. It says, holy am I, for holy be you. Right. Woo! Yeah. Forwards and backwards, the word says the same thing. Be holy. Don't get it twisted. He said, be holy. 
Why? Because he's holy. I don't care what uh, Reverend over here does. He's not basing me off of what you do. He's basing me off of what he does. And so I can say, well, you know, Brother Elder Murphy did it. He said, Ann, my mother used to say to me when I come in and say, well, all the kids are doing it. She said, whose mother am I? I'm your mother. You live in this house. I don't care what they do. Or you know the favorite one. If Mike jumps off the bridge, you going to jump off the bridge? (laughs) See? That's what he would say. All right? So sanctify them. In Psalms 119.11, it says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. The New American Standard says it like this. Your word have I treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. We put God's word in so that that word comes up when we get ready to step out of the will of God. And that word says, "Uh uh-uh, God said. God said. God said. And you can't argue with God. Remember, he's like your mother. You going to jump off that bridge? Mm -hmm. Then are you ready to accept the consequences of jumping off that bridge? God, oh, he's praying for us. It tells us in Psalm 37, 31, the law of his God is in his heart. His steps do not falter. When we allow God to sanctify us, oh, Jesus, we don't falter. Oh, yeah, you may hesitate and look, and say, but God says, go on, and you say, okay, God, I'm going. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what's going to happen when I get there, but I know you're with me. And as long as you're with me, I'm all right. You got my back, my front, my sides. God, you got me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The next thing he says, unite them as one. We are working on this one because we're in a mess. Everybody's for himself. And I'm talking about in the church. I ain't talking to the people out in the street. I'm talking to the church people that we can come together. We got a church over here that says, we are the church, and they don't have nothing. We got it all, and nobody else has it. God says, unite and be one. There's only one God, one faith, one baptism. That's it. We make up all these different things, Methodist and Lutheran and Catholic and Jehovah Witness and all. Where is Jesus? That's where he wants to know, where is Jesus? That's the question. Who is he to you? He says we have to unite and be one. It's not about our own gospel that we're putting out there. It's about what did Jesus say? He said, believe on the Father. Believe on the Father. Be holy as I am holy. Hallelujah. Let your will be yielded to his will. And so he says, unite them as one. Remember the scriptures that says the body is one, but it has different functions? That's what we are. We should be one body, and different ones have a function. What are you good at? Well, you do that. And we're over here, and we're good at this. I'm not talking about preaching uh, doctrine. I'm talking about what are you good at? What service can you do? How are you going out and doing for God's kingdom? And then all of us come together. Now, wouldn't it be something if all of us from the different faiths got together in one place? Oh, we'd have to go down to the the, uh, the, uh, stadium and all come together. And this church can sing. So we let y'all sing. And this church over here knows how to usher. We let them usher. And then this one back here got the word to preach. Let them preach. And this one over here knows how to deal with the kids. Let them deal with the kids. Oh, my God. Can you imagine the witness that would be to the world? They say, wow, all these people that got together and there's no arguing about who's doing what is whatever God has given you to do. And if I happen to be in this church to sing and I can't sing, but I can usher, I say, Lord, can I give you my service? And come over and usher, usher over here. Oh, you know what? I love kids. I work with you and do with the kids because we're united. We're one. We have one purpose. That's to lift up the name of Jesus. Oh, my God. And forget about the little eyes and the big U. It's about the kingdom. 
and that we can do it, that God be glorified. He says, unite as one, one purpose, working together for kingdom, no division. We are only as strong as the, y'all don't know that one? The weakest link. We're only as strong as the weakest link. What we need to do is link up with those who are weak and say, come on. Isn't that what Jesus said? He said, if you're followers of me, follow me as I follow Christ. Isn't that what, isn't that what Paul said? He said, follow me. That's what he, he was taking those that didn't know how and say, come on, do what I do. Here's the problem. What are you doing? That's the problem. What are you doing? If you're not doing nothing, then you, you don't want nobody following you. But if you're doing something, you can go out and say, yep, you can come with me. You can catch me at home. You can catch me on the street. You can catch me wherever I am because I'm serving the Lord. Come on with me. And so that's what he says. He says, unite. We are only as strong as the weakest link. Number four, stay true to the mission. As our example, Jesus was tested. Yes, he was. Let me tell you, you will be too. You will be tested just to see. Do you have what you say you have? Do you trust who you say you trust? Jesus was tested. It says that when he uh, came off of that 40-day fast, went into the wilderness, says the angel led him into the wilderness. Mm -hmm. Got out there, and the first thing, (laughs) devil come and said, "Um, I know you're hungry. See them stones down there? Why don't you make them into bread? You can do that. You know, he didn't see Jesus heal and all that. Turn that bread, I mean the stones, into bread. Jesus said, man don't live by bread alone, but by every word. I, I can see him now getting full. <laughs> you see, because by, by the word, it's filling him up. Then he goes on and, and the, the devil takes him, what, to the pinnacle? He said, jump off. Just jump off. I'll give you the whole kingdom. How can you give me what I already got? <laughs> he said, the angels said they would catch you and keep you from stomping your foot. He says, tempt not the Lord thy God. Some of us have been tempting God a long time. It's time to stop that. Lord, if you really love me, you'll do this. God said, I'm going to show you how much I love you. Wow. See? Ask me how I know. Because I said it. <laughs> See? I, 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 I said it. I said it. Some of you don't know, now this year, it will be eight years that my daughter died. And she had cancer. And I'm living for the Lord, you know. She was living for the Lord. We praying every day, oh, God, you're going to heal her. It's going to be a miracle. I'm praying and touching her. And uh, you sure you say, come on, let's say the sinner's prayer again and all this. And I'm hearing other people, their their children is getting delivered and rising up. And I'm like, God, I know you're going to do this for my daughter. I know you're going to do it. And one day I went in to visit her. And the Lord said to me, she's going to die. And so I said to someone else who was believing just like me, I went to them, I said, Kelly's going to die. And she said to me, are you saying that or are you asking me? I said, I'm telling you. She said, your daughter has been wanting to leave but wouldn't because of you. But now because God has told me that I could, the hardest thing for me to do was to go in that room and say to my daughter, it's okay, you can go. That is allowing God to test you. Not that God does, but the situation tests you. Now, I, you know, that sounds all good right now. Afterwards, I say, God, if you can't save my daughter, I don't need to serve you. I have been doing all that I know to do, and you didn't save my daughter. And I'm up here being a witness for you every day, and you didn't save my daughter. The hurt. But here's the thing. God, let me say it. And didn't kill me. In fact, what he said to me, you know where your daughter's going. You want me to take somebody else's daughter who ain't saved? I said, okay, God. 
I said, okay, God. God will allow us to go through a test to strengthen us. It's not to kill you. It's to kill that thing that would stand in between you serving the Lord and serving the flesh. It has put a new light on me. God gave me. He said, you know what? He said, whenever you feel like crying, cry. So no matter where I'm at, I don't care if you stand in there looking at me, I'm crying because now I done thought about my daughter and I'm going to cry. That was my child. And so when I go to minister to people who have lost a loved one, I say to them, cry as much as you want to. I don't care who is looking. That was your person. And you cry because God has given you those tears to heal you. And then when it's all said and done, now you go on and keep on walking for God and live for him. God will allow you to go to a test because he knows your purpose. What is your purpose? And until your purpose is completed, you can't get out of it. But let me tell you this. Don't keep fighting against that purpose because God will allow you to have what you want. And you will be the loser. My purpose is to be here and heal people through what I go through so that they can see you can live in spite of and you can still be looking good. I have a birthday coming up, and I'm not going to tell y'all right now how old I'm going to be. But I tell you, I don't look what I am. Thank you, Jesus. Because God is good. And he says, I beautify the meek with salvation. Hallelujah. And every year it gets better and better and better. Number five, new converts he prayed for. Not only for us to win souls, but to strengthen souls and to guide souls. We are the witnesses that have to go out. God has called us to go out and tell them about him. And so he's praying that we would have many added to the fold. He says, teach through the word and through life. Though it may seem unfair, your life is always on display. Something I was taught when I first got saved back at Christian Temple, we were taught you do not have a right. You have no rights. You say, but I have a right to be mad. No, you don't. I got a right to not do it. No, you don't. Your life is no longer yours. It belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. So you might as well take that phrase out of your mouth. You do not have a right to do anything but live for the Lord. And to do it in a way that is pleasing to him. Hallelujah. Number six says, he's praying that we behold Jesus' glory. We need to see his glory. There are times that you, that Shekinah glory, we don't talk about that anymore, but the Shekinah glory that would come in and it would blind you, that all you could do, whoo, Jesus, is give glory and honor to his name. You can't say any words because this Shekinah glory is in there. And all you want to do is just to stay in that glory and allow God to work on you. Because that glory shines on you. And anything that is not pure and holy up to the Lord, he takes it, takes it out right then because he can see it. So he says, I pray that they see my glory. That's my prayer, that I see the glory. With everything that's going on so bad, we need to see God's glory. Does he have glory in all these bombings going on? Does he get glory in the babies being killed in that? Not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Because now we pray more. We start looking at people and listening to people and hearing what it is that they say. The world isn't listening. And so all these things keep happening. But the church should be listening. The church should be paying attention. The church needs to be out there on display that people will see there is hope. Do you know why the world is the way it is? They have no hope. Do you know why our young people are going to jail? They have no hope. When I talk to them, they're like, my mom don't care. My dad don't care. They're out there on drugs. Nobody cares. So I have no hope. We have to give them the hope. We have to let the glory of God shine through us. He's moving in this present world. We need to see his presence and bow to his presence. The last thing that Jesus prayed, and this is where he wanted to start in the first place. He reunites us with him. That was his purpose back in Genesis, that he would have someone that would fellowship with him. 
He's saying, now Najeda went through all this, and they finally getting to the end, and I am on the throne. Reunite us. But we have to be those sons of God. We, we have to be able to take off these worldly robes and put on our white robes that have been purified through the blood. He said, but we'll be together. And, and if you read Revelation, it says, won't be no need for light because he's there. <laughs> but, but here's the other part. We are too. <laughs> Woo! Can you imagine the brightness that is going to be there? Because it says we shall be like he is. Oh, my God. The lights and the heavens and the praise that will be a, you know what, I hate to bust you all's bubble, but all y'all that sing that song, when I get to heaven, I'm going to walk up. No, you ain't. When I get to heaven, I'm going to, no, you're not. <laughs> Remember, that's God's kingdom. When you come to his kingdom, you do what he wants. And what does he want? Praise. Oh, my God. What does he want? He wants praise. So we'll praise him 24-7. Hallelujah. And we'll be in tune. <laughs> it, it, it'll be so much harmony going on there. <laughs> Woo, Jesus. Because guess what? We'll be a one accord. <laughs> Won't nobody be saying, no, I don't want to sing that song today. I want to sing this one. They'll say, no. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise his name. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise his name. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise his name. Ha! Ah! Glory to God. Praise his name. Praise his name. Hallelujah. I tell you, saints, this is our practice ground. This is where we learn and practice how to do it. So that when we get there, we're right on one accord. And we are reunited with our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that you realize every day that you go through, God prayed for you. I don't care if nobody on earth prays for you. God prayed for you. And he did it before he went to his kingdom. He said, this is what I leave for you so that you'll be able to make it. Remember that. The things that he prayed. And in the end, we'd be reunited.